Bismillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah. Excellencies, friends of the dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Tonight, Dar al Athar al-Islamiyya is doubly pleased to present both Professor Jan Just Whitcomb and Yasmin Saleh. Like that of their colleague, Dr. David Roxborough, their topic, Illustrated Manuscripts, is a favorite with our audience. This is the first time that Dar al Athar al-Islamiyya presented two speakers at the same time. It is a privilege and honor to present both of you. And of course, Yasmin is a, a student, PhD student, and a professor is a well-known authority. Professor Jan Whitcombs has been active in immense scholarly activity into Islamic manuscripts. As a curator and a founder and editor of several journals on the subject, he is one of the eminent authorities on the subject. Together with Yasmin Saleh, who has done considerable research on artistic representation, the forthcoming discussion on Dala'al al-Khayrat promises to intrigue and fascinate. The study of this famous book of prayers for the Prophet, composed by Muhammad al-Jazuli in 15th century Morocco, includes first-hand research conducted in Kuwait and offers insight and raises new questions about this well-known work. Yasmin will start the discussion, and after 15 minutes, Professor Whitcomb will continue the subject. First, Yasmin Saleh. There are three main themes that surround Dala al-Khayrat a prayer manual that venerates the Prophet Muhammad compo composed by Muhammad ibn Sulaiman al-Jazuli, death date 869 Hijra, 1465 Common Era. First, the illustrations of the Prophet Muhammad's grave and mosque in Medina distinguish this manual. Second, it's the historical significance of al-Jazuli's Sufi sainthood that one can illustrate the popularity of this manual. Lastly, in the context of the perpetual and personal readings of the Sufi worshiper who is repeating these prayers and becoming closer to the Prophet and God, that one can begin to understand the illustrations and the manuscript in its entirety. In folio 23b of LNS 3MS from Dar al Athar al Islamiyya, the Al Sabah collection, three tombs are represented by three gold rectangles. There's one. The tombs are of the Prophet Muhammad and his two companions, Abu Bakr and Umar, each identified by the inscription on top. The Prophet's tomb is diagonally placed above Abu Bakr's, which is above Umar's. A gold lamp that hangs from the polylobed abstracted mosque arches that are framed within a red, gold, and blue background. The gold halo at the top marks both folios, perhaps a reference to a prayer niche, a mihrab. The adjacent folio, 24A, also an abstracted depiction of the Prophet's mosque. A pulpit, minbar, mihrab, and lamp are set against an arch background. The following will be an introductory analysis of the text that directly comes before the illustrations of LNS 3MS. After the brief textual analysis, I'll place the manuscript in a Moroccan socio-historical context, based on the life of Al-Jazuli. Lastly, I will introduce Professor Vitkam's work on Dala'il al-Khayrat via comparative material from Harvard University's Sackler Museum. Professor Vitkam has published greatly on this subject and knows the various readings of illustrated and unillustrated Dala'il genre. A physical description of LNS 3 MS. A brown leather binding with a stamped medallion and spandrels protect this manuscript. With no frontispiece to this manuscript, the text begins with the honorific invocation of the name of God and the, his prophet Muhammad and his following, and folio 1b 2a. A heading is located on the third line, written in gold muhaqqaq script, and was written on a blue and white abstracted floral background. 
The heading is enclosed in a rectangle with a white and gold vegetal border that extends into a gold scroll marginal medallion. It reads, قال الشيخ الإمام العالم أبو عبد الله سيد محمد بن سليمان الجزولي الشريف الحسني رضي الله عنه. Translation. The scholar, master of knowledge, Abu Abdullah Sayyid Muhammad bin Sulaiman al Jazuli, descendant of Hassan, which is the Prophet's grandson, peace be upon him. The manuscript contains 172 folios that are written in large brown Maghribi script, with voweling in maroon, blue, green, and orange pink. Certain words in the text are in a pale purple, pink, red, uh, blue, and gold. The folios measure 25.7 by 19 centimeters and have been trimmed. There are nine lines per folio that are enclosed in a double red and blue margin. There are various headings in the manuscript that mark the beginnings of sections and e are either written in muhaqqaq or floriated Kufic script. Text of Dala'il al-Khayrat in, in LNS 3 MS. The intention of Dala'il al-Khayrat, as is stated in the first couple of folios, is that the prayers for the Prophet will increase one's closeness to God. The Prophet Muhammad is the intercessor for the reader of the manual, and as al-Jazuli states that the angels will continuously pray for the person who prays for the Prophet. That's in the fourth line right here, for those that read Arabic. Uh, if one increases their prayers for the Prophet, especially on a Friday, then they will get 10 hasanat, which is merits. If one prays 100 times on the same day, then 80 years of sin will be forgiven. And that's the last line here. In addition, whoever needs anything from God, then one should increase prayer for the Prophet and then ask God for his needs. It is in this realm of counting and repetition of prayers for the Prophet that one can become part of Ahl nur the people of God. According to Al-Jazuli's biographer, Muhammad Al-Mahdi Al-Fasi, death date 1108 Hijra, 1698 Common Era, the person who reads the Dala'il Al-Khayrat 40 times in a period less than 40 days then gets what he or she has asked for. The person who forgets to pray for the Prophet has been misled from the way to heaven. On Judgment Day, God will only know the person who has prayed for the Prophet. These prayers are interesting because there is an element of charismatic fantasy. For example, the continuous prayer approximately 100 times for the Prophet is equal to 500 years in heaven, and God will build the person who has prayed for the Prophet a castle. In addition, if one keeps praying for the Prophet, then a bird with 70,000 wings is born from those prayers. Each one of the wings have 70,000 feathers, and in every feather there are 70,000 faces, and in, every, and in each of the 70,000 faces there are 70,000 tongues. Each one of these tongues are saying in the name of God in 70,000 languages. And God is writing the thawab, recompense in the good sense. In other words, the person who reads this manual has been guaranteed a spot in heaven. The purpose is to show this deep love and veneration for the Prophet Muhammad as is elaborated in folios 16a to 17a. This, this is only two folios from that section. The Prophet Muhammad has asked, which of your following should we honor and love? And he responded that they have the signs of their loves, their love for, their, for the Prophet. There are people who are addicted to mentioning my name, alamatuhum idmana dhikri, and praying for me. Then the Prophet was asked, who has the strength of faith, Iman? And that is the person that who wishes to see me in everything that he owns, and the person's love for the Prophet fills the ground with gold. The Prophet says that he knows the people who pray for him, and with this ominous statement, Al-Jazuri introduces the next section of the text, the Prophet's 201 names, written in gold muhaqqaq script. The section of the Prophet's names begins with Muhammad, written in gold maghribi script and Ahmed as the second name on the list. According to the Encyclopedia of the Qur'an, the names Muhammad and Ahmed are the only two names of the Prophet mentioned in the Qur'an. Through the Hadith, the prophetic tradition, his names become descriptions of his mission, such as Mahin, he who erases infidelity. In devotional literature, lists of Prophet's names are expanded, and they are called Al-Asma al-Sharifa. The list of 201 names in Al-Jazuli are, are from a variety of sources. Some are from the Qur'an, such as Abdullah, servant of God, 
and then Taha and Yasin that come from the beginning of Surah 20 and 36. Others are descriptions of the Prophet and his mission, such as Rasul. Through this textual reading, one begins to think about the Prophet Muhammad in a linguistic sense. The framework and structure of the Prophet's names allows the reader to experience the next section's visuality, the depiction of the Prophet's tomb and mosque. The heading reads just as Professor Vitcom has translated. This is the description of the blessed garden that the Prophet is buried in, in with his companions Abu Bakr and Umar. I'm skipping over the poem, which is right here, for the sake of time. Also the text that comes after the illustration, because this is Professor Vitcom's speciality. From this limited introduction to the text of Dala al Khairat, one understands through constant dhikr, remembering and recollecting, the presence of the Prophet is explicitly evoked. Yet the implications of the of, and the power of the text cannot be understood without a historical context of the development of Moroccan Sufism and its links to al jazulis life. Who is Muhammad al Sulaiman al jazuli And how did he come to write this prayer manual? Based on the research of Vincent J. Cornell, I'll summarize his life and his role as an important Sufi saint who acted as an intercessor to his followers, as the Prophet Muhammad did for his companions. Historical context, al Jazuli's life. al Jazuli was born in Jazula, Morocco, and was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. His descent is linked to the Fatimid resettlement in Morocco after the fall of Egypt to the Ayyubids in 567 Hijra, 1171, Common Era. According to his biographer, Muhammad al-Mahdi al-Fasi, the name Ja'far in the al Jazuli genealogy is linked to the son of Hussein and the fourth Shiite Imam, who had resettled in Jazula. Al Jazuli's sanctity begins as a relative of the Prophet Muhammad. And Professor Vitkam elaborated that this is the link also to the King of Morocco as well. Due to the tribal unrest, Al Jazuli leaves his hometown of Jazula and heads to Fez and studies at Madrasat al Safarin. It is said that he spent hours in his room studying and displayed a deep sense of spirituality. After Fez, Al Jazuli studied with the Sufi Abu Abdullah Sharif Bani Amagar. Death Day 850 Hijra, 1446, Common Era, and was led into an anti-Portuguese anti jihad. In 1415, the Portuguese con conquer Septa. And in 1437, al Jazuli participates in the fight against the Portuguese in Tangier, and they take back the town. Between 1439-1446, al Jazuli was based in Rebat, Tita, and Fitr. These are the first two maps we already saw. I just put them together in one. Uh, slide so you have it side by side with his spiritual lineage. There are conflicting biographical sources on where Al Jazuli spent the next part of his life, be it in the Muslim West or East. One claim is that he spent it in Dukkala coast, uh, Dukkala. Yet others state that he spent seven years at the Prophet's tomb in Medina. One other source, source situates Al Jazuli at Al Azhar Mosque with the mystic Ab Abdul Aziz Al Ajmi. It is likely that Al Jazuli, after the death of his Sheikh, goes on a pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. He then heads to Cairo to pay respect to the tomb of Hussein and studied at Al-Azhar with Abdul Aziz Al-Ajmi. Al-Jazuli is back in Morocco by 1453. Cornell speculates that Al-Jazuli probably wrote Dala al khayrat during his travels in the East, as he hands over the manuscript to his disciple, Muhammad al sughair al-Sahili, in 1457-8, and the copy becomes known as the Sahili copy, upon which all other manuscripts are based. After coming back from his travels and writing the Dala al Khairat, al Jazuli began to travel around Morocco attracting followers. Due to the Portuguese presence in the region, pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina were, was dangerous. And as a replacement, al Jazuli institutes the pilgrimage to Sufi shrines of both living and dead saints in the region. One of the most important parts of the Jazuliya order is the daily recitation of prayers on behalf of the Prophet Muhammad from Dala al Khairat. Al Jazuli attracted many followers. He was charismatic and demonstrated his closeness to God and the Prophet via his lineage and his appropriation of Sufi practices. Al Jazuli gained popularity. He preached jihad against the Portuguese, which caused unrest in the town of Asafi, where the merchants were gaining uh, from the trade with the Portuguese. Consequently, in 1459, he is expelled from Asafi and moves to the town of Haha. He establishes a new ribat in Afugal. 
It is here that Al-Jazuli dies in 1465. Al-Jazuli's body is moved to Marrakesh. Professor Vitkam will should be showing the location of his tomb. I've only given you a glimpse of his life. There are many other layers to Al-Jazuli's life that contribute to contextualizing the manuscript. However, I'd like to conclude by returning to the intriguing illustrations of Dala'il al-Khayrat, which is the subject of Professor Vitkam's scholarship and talk. There's a great variety of illustrations of Dala'il al-Khayrat. According to Professor Vitkam's scholarship, that there's a change in the images before and after the rise of Wahhabism. LNS 3MS from Dar al-Athar al islamiya falls into the category of before Wahhabism because it displays the tomb of the Prophet and his companions. Here are two manuscripts from Harvard University's Sackler Museum, Islamic and later Indian art department that fall into the before and after categories. HUAM 1984.464 falls into the category of before Wahhabism. It's an undated prayer book that includes the La'il al-Khayrat along with the Burda of Busiri that date 1294 common era, and some other devotional poems. It, can, it contains various images that come before the text of Dala al Khayrat. So the first image is of Mecca, and you can see the black stone right here. I don't know if it's clear. Of Mecca. And the other details, such as the pulpit. The three mihrab indications are related to the three schools of law that have stations in Mecca. The next image is the muhr, or seal of prophethood, the supposed birthmark that was on the shoulder of the prophet. And next is the grave of the prophet. Next, an image of the prophet's sandal. However, I mean, this can't be read because the uh, paint has all been mixed together over time. Uh, and then once the, the text of Dala al-Khayrat begins, then the image of the Prophet's grave, which you've become accustomed to, and the pulpit in Medina. The other manuscript is HUAM 1984.465, which is an Ottoman manuscript that is dated by its colophon uh, to the scribe Abdul Qadir al-Shukri uh, to the beginning of Sha'ban 1216, beginning of December 1801. This manuscript is captivating because it has a three-dimensional perspective representation of Mecca and Medina. Professor Vitkam places this type of manuscript in a post-Wahhabism context. And with this brief introduction, I'd like to introduce Professor Vitkam, who will elaborate on the images of Dala al khayrat and this conflict with Wahhabism in greater detail. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> Thank you for coming in such great numbers. I'm very honored. I'm honored also by the invitation of Sheikh Hossa to come here. I was here in this same place uh, nine years ago. I'm uh, very pleased to be back here and uh, tell you something about uh, illustrations in uh, the prayer book of uh, Al Jazuli. I'm very grateful also to Yasmin to mention and to 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 make um, uh, to give an introduction uh, to my own presentation. Uh, what I want to do is basically three things. I uh, want, in a very general way, show you a number of illustrations from manuscripts um, uh, of Mecca and Medina. I uh, will, um, uh, by doing so, show you uh, manuscripts from a great variety um, of styles coming from uh, almost the entire uh, Islamic world, from the very west in uh, Mauritania to the very east in um, uh, Indonesia and in um, uh, Central Asia. And then also, uh, while I am showing this, I will try, but these are just thoughts of mine, because in, in, in scholarship we have no uh, truth. We, we try to find it, but uh, it is rare that you really find it. But I show you some of my ideas about why the illustrations are in the book, and also why there is a shift in the illustration of the book. I will begin with a number of um, uh, illustrations of Mecca and Medina uh, as they occur also outside the, um, uh, um, uh, the prayer book by Jazuli. 
Uh, for instance, what I call in sacred uh, geography a Ptolemaean projection of the world. Uh, the world as a flat disk. The north is, is down, as usually in Islamic uh, cartography, the south is up. And um, uh, you see in the very center of the world um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula with the, uh, in, the, in the center point of the circle uh, with the Kaaba in the very um, uh, center of the world. Here's, of course, Africa. Uh, here's uh, Europe and here's, uh, here's Asia and a large ocean, al mohit Now you understand why it is called al mohit because it goes around this flat disk. And um, when we, as if we were a bird, would fly to um, uh, the Kaaba and uh, hover just above it, we would see here the Kaaba and um, uh, some of the small buildings next to it. And the miniaturist of this uh, uh, drawing has written in the circles around the Kaaba the uh, prayer orientations of um, uh, a great uh, number of uh, towns in the world of Islam. So from everywhere you can pray uh, in this same um, uh, uh, world, in everywhere, here the south, here the north, uh, and here the east and there the west, um, uh, pray with the uh, Kaaba as your Qibla. Going to Medina uh, shows us a somewhat different um, uh, uh, picture. Uh, Medina uh, is the, uh, contains the um, pr uh, mosque of the Prophet Muhammad where he has been uh, buried and um, uh, the usual representation, this comes from a uh, book about the pilgrimage, uh, although Medina is not part of the um, uh, pilgrimage, many pilgrims will visit Medina anyway. And um, uh, you will see here, I will show you some basic elements that we will find on many um, uh, uh, illustrations of uh, um, uh, Medina. Uh, uh, under the uh, cupola, the burial chamber, here the, the three graves, the Prophet Muhammad and the two Khalifas, Abu Bakr and Omar. And here, slightly aside, the grave of uh, Fatima, the daughter of the Prophet. Here um, we see uh, already the minbar, and they are here. I will not go deep into this just because of the time, uh, all sorts of elements that we uh, see in, um, uh, in many representations of uh, Medina. The only, I think, um, um, unusual uh, uh, feature of this particular miniature is that also people are uh, depicted and the manuscript uh, comes from an, uh, it's an Iranian book and where um, uh, in the pictorial traditions of uh, Persia uh, there was much less hesitation to depict uh, human beings. <coughs> Now you see immediately this is again uh, Medina and um, in, uh, in a printed uh, book, in a printed uh, sheet that has been colored and in fact uh, the function of this document is that someone whose name should be filled here in uh, could um, by witness of four people prove to the people back home that he had been actually in the uh, uh, in the Prophet's Mosque in Medina. This is a mid-19th century uh, document. And this, of course, served for those people uh, to show that they really had been there when they had done the pilgrimage and the ziyara uh, on behalf of a deceased person. <coughs> Another um, representation of the Mosque of the Prophet, now coming from Indonesia, from West Sumatra, Natal, early um, 19th century. Here again, you see a number of basic elements, the cupola and the burial chamber. Um, uh, the, uh, the minbar is here. 
and, and other um, elements that apparently belong to the whole set of iconographical elements uh, of the um, uh, Prophet's Mosque. One of the um, uh, elements that you see sometimes in books about Medina is the Baqi al Harkat cemetery outside Medina. Many important persons of the history, of the early history of Islam, uh, were uh, buried there. And uh, going there, visiting not only the Prophet's mosque, but also going to the Baqi, uh, was to ask. Uh, intercession. Uh, at present, uh, uh, as most of you will know, the Baqiya is still there, but not a um, uh, uh, fully fledged uh, cemetery because most um, uh, buildings have been um, uh, removed by now. And here again, from an entirely different style, in fact the same, if you look uh, here at the Baqiya uh, al Gharkat in, an, in South Asian manuscript, also from West uh, Sumatra in Indonesia, exactly the same thing. You see how many ways there are, uh, because these are the graves, here is written in Malay, the, the graves of the uh, holy people, uh, Orang Baik, and um, uh, 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 but it is basically the same idea. So you can uh, depict the same thing in many styles. And that is also one of the uh, ideas that I will give you uh, so many ways to uh, show one and the same thing. Now about the uh, Dalai al Khairat. Uh, um, uh, Yasmin has um, uh, given us a num shown us a number of manuscripts, and I will do that as well. But the nice thing with the book Dalai Al Khairat is that it is still available in the printed editions, hundreds and hundreds of different printed editions all over the um, uh, world of Islam, and uh, uh, via the internet you can buy it um, in, 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 uh, in a great variety of editions. I quick just in order to show you how also today the book is still very popular, show you a number of covers or title pages um, uh, uh, of modern editions. Here, uh, Istanbul, uh, about uh, more than 10 years ago now, published, and there was the whole thing, um, also the Arabic text in uh, Latin script as at that time um, uh, it was not possible to publish uh, or, or hardly publish, hardly possible to publish books in Arabic script in Turkey. Here, another edition that I purchased in uh, Java in um, Indonesia, Kudus, uh, this is a large town, Kudus, Al-Quds, in fact, it's uh, named after Jerusalem, and um, uh, edition of the Dalai al Khairat. Uh, published there in 2000. Here an Istanbul edition of a large commentary by Kara Dawood, Black David, um, uh, on um, uh, the Dalai al Khairat, in which almost each word is um, explained um, uh, by the author. Or here a recent edition from uh, Pakistan, um, uh, an Urdu translation of, the com of a large commentary by Al Fasi on the Dalai Al Khairat. You see, the book is studied and used all over the um, uh, Islamic world. I could make the number of images that I have of printed editions much larger. I will not do that uh, here just for the sake of time, but you get an impression. The interior, not the grave itself, I don't have pictures of that, but the interior of the mosque of, uh, as he is called nowadays in Morocco, Sidi Ben Sliman, uh, is, uh, Ibn Suleiman Al Jazuli in Marrakesh. He's one of the seven patron saints of um, uh, Marrakesh. And um, uh, there are many sessions in which um, uh, the Dalai al Khairat are being recited. I have one photograph of that. Um, not in this um, uh, uh, mosque of 
uh, Al Jazuli, but of another patron saint, Al Septi, one of my colleagues in Leiden gave me this picture. But you see, there, there's an uh, imam who is, uh, he's not on the f uh, photograph, uh, who is reciting, and um, uh, there's a large audience that sometimes falls in and, uh, as, as in a sort of litany, answers to um, the um, uh, words of the imam. In a different uh, room is the room for uh, women and uh, children. As Yasmin has also already mentioned, the large part of the basic material of the um, uh, salawat, the blessings uh, um, over the Prophet Muhammad, is a list of names of 201 names uh, that uh, I think uh, Jazuli himself has collected from all sorts of sources, um, uh, more or less uh, more al along the model of Al Asma Al Husna, which are 99 names, and he has uh, made a list of 201 Asma Al Nabi. And um, uh, this is the basic material for all the blessing prayers in the book. And in the introductory part, uh, there is a list of um, uh, these prayers. This is a manuscript from West uh, Java, uh, 18th century manuscript, where you see the list, or part of the list, because these are not 201 uh, names of the, uh, the honorific names of the Prophet Muhammad. <coughs> a page from a manuscript uh, from uh, Mauritania, or um, northern Nigeria, so the most western part of the world of, this, of Islam, also taken from um, the uh, introductory part before the actual blessings start. And uh, this is the part that Yasmin also mentioned. Huh? You, 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 you see this is the typical, uh, what they call Sudani script, where he sifa, the, the dot under the fa is written. If there is one dot on top, it's the kaf in this type of writing. Where he sifa ta rauda al mubaraka, leti dufina fiha, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, wa sahibahu Abu Bakr wa Omar. And on the next page, uh, there are two anecdotes on um, uh, uh, what, what is called the Rauda al Mubaraka, the burial chamber with the um, uh, uh, tombs of the Prophet and his two, uh, uh, the first two Khalifas. Now, I think that the first, um, uh, the earliest manuscripts. Um, uh, of the Dalai al Khairat just had this text, as we see in, uh, we saw in this Mauritanian manuscript. But if the author uh, says, wa hadihi sifat al mubaraka, then you can imagine that at some stage, copyists of the manuscript think, okay, if, if this is the text, we will make a small drawing of it. And they, um, uh, you find then suddenly appearing um, uh, in some of the manuscripts of the Dalai al Khairat a uh, small drawing, uh, very often very simple, sometimes very artistic. We will see a few in which you see indeed a niche and uh, representing a mosque and um, uh, a lamp, of course, and the, the three tombs, the uh, prophet and the two khalifas. And um, there is a number of manuscripts in which you see this one um, um, illustration just next to the text that I have just shown and read for you. Or you see it in a very symbolic way, a simple graphic way of representation uh, as in this one, but the basic elements are there. A niche, a lamp, and the three graves. And just an elaboration, I would say, of the small text, um, uh, the description of uh, Rauda al-Mubaraka, the blessed garden. <clears throat> or 
even if you would not know that um, uh, that is meant, you see in a very simple manuscript uh, from, from India with the Arabic text in large script and between the lines a Persian translation. Uh, you see, but you would only recognize it if you know about this a pictorial tradition of the three graves in the blessed garden that it is represented like that here, just as part of the text instead of uh, three or four lines of text. This is a very simple way of representing it. But it is evident that at some moment in time um, the text about the blessed garden uh, was illustrated by um, uh, sometimes very sophisticated, sometimes very simple illustrations. <clears throat> and here again, um, uh, from the same manuscripts which I showed you of the list of the Asma Nebi, um, the, uh, the Rauda. And you see also um, that uh, coming from, uh, from Banten, West Java, west of Jakarta. And um, uh, uh, you see that the pictorial tradition of Southeast Asia with like this sort of Chinese-like architectural elements are added here. And, um, uh, but it is uh, with the basic elements, the niche, the mosque maybe, and the three uh, graves that are represented here with captions indeed that it is the, the grave of the prophet and then the names of Abu Bakr and Omar to the other uh, three. You, you can understand also that um, the Dalai al Khairat, although it is very popular, the popularity is um, uh, confined to the world of the Sunna because uh, Shiites would never um, uh, place Abu Bakr and Omar in such a prominent uh, place in a prayer book. So in Iran, I have never been able to discover a copy of um, uh, the Layl al Khairat. And here another one, you see my fingers um, uh, when, uh, of my um, uh, left hand when I uh, photographed it, a very small book, just the, um, uh, the, the Medina uh, Rauda Mubaraka uh, here uh, as a single illustration. And then suddenly you see not only a single illustration coming up in manuscripts as we have seen here. I don't need to explain that anymore to you, uh, the, the burial chamber in the mosque of Medina. But suddenly there is a double illustration, and this comes a bit later. And um, uh, this the, the other, the opposite page, um, and usually it is in this order, but sometimes the order is reversed. You see the minbar, the, minbar, the pulpit of the prophet. And um, now, the graves were, as we have seen, mentioned in the text. So the image of the graves is, is enough. We can understand why someone came uh, to the idea to uh, illustrate that part of the text. But the minbar is not mentioned in the text. So then you must ask yourself, why is the minbar now suddenly mentioned here in the text? And um, um, uh, is, is, is um, suddenly depicted in the manuscript, whereas it is not mentioned in the text. Now, if there is no reason in the text for giving the illustration of the minbar, of the pulpit, then there must be a reason outside the text why. Uh, this, this is not just a fantasy. Uh, painters do not just paint something because they see an empty page. What they see, has, what they put in the book, that, that, must, that can be explained. And um, uh, there is an, a hadith in uh, which uh, the prophet says that whoever is standing between my, his grave, then whoever is standing between my grave and my pulpit, it is as if he is standing in paradise. And uh, so the painter who did this um, double image gave the owner of the book, the reader of the prayer book, the idea that if only you were standing um, uh, uh, with, in, on one side, the grave of the prophet, the other side, the, um, uh, uh, the pulpit, that you are already 
as if you are in, um, uh, in paradise. And there is, in fact, uh, you can read that also in the older pilgrimage guides, a certain place in the, prophet of the, in the uh, mosque of the Prophet Muhammad in Medina, which is called Malkif and Nebi. If you stand there, then you can see there the grave, you can see there the pulpit, and um, uh, then it is as if you are uh, in the uh, gardens of paradise. But the makers of this book give, have the advantage that they put their reader already in that same spot. And uh, this has become a very popular um, uh, um, uh, combination of images in the Laila al -Khairat. I will show you a few. Uh, you see, the, the, the basic idea is the same. The way in which it is uh, shown is a bit different. But we see the three graves here in, under a niche. Here we see the pulpit, and here also the mehrab. Um, uh, as the other part of the mosque of uh, the Prophet. But the idea is the same as the previous image. Here we see it again in a very simple way. We have very sophisticated, very um, um, beautifully executed uh, books, which means that the prayer book had come in high social circles. And we know, of course, that um, uh, it, uh, there were, was a royal interest in it, both in Morocco, but also later in the court of the Ottoman sultans. And, but this is a very simple um, uh, illustration uh, of the same combination, uh, the burial chamber and the pulpit. And I'll show you one or two more. Here it is even more simple, showing that there, uh, it is also part of, of very, uh, uh, this is not even a painting, this is um, uh, pasted paper um, uh, on an open double page in a manuscript of the Dalai al Khairat. Very simply done, and, uh, but uh, conveying the same idea. Uh, something has gone wrong, um, the, uh, or gone wrong, it is different. The order here is in reverse. Uh, here the uh, um, uh, burial chamber is at the left and the pulpit at the right. But otherwise, um, uh, the same idea is given here. <clears throat> and here, in terms of uh, sophistication, the other extreme uh, mid-19th century illustration, uh, here uh, behind the grill, an almost realistic um, uh, uh, representation of the burial chamber, and he, uh, here a highly ornamented um, uh, pulpit. And here a manuscript of, um, uh, from Central Asia, where you see the two elements combined uh, here, the burial chamber of the Prophet Muhammad and the two Khalifas, and um, the grave of uh, 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 the Prophet's daughter uh, Fatima, and the um, uh, pulpit. So it is a an, uh, an, uh, combination of elements that one sees uh, very often. And here, I think, uh, you see such a very large uh, mi uh, minaret uh, of which you often see in Central Asia. I remember having seen such minarets in Bukhara and in uh, Khiwa, enormous, high and massive um, minarets. And that is also, it, it shows the, um, the, uh, the provenance of the manuscripts where, as we have seen, the Chinese elements, here Central Asian elements, um, these are local additions to an image that uh, is almost universal. Here another uh, combination of the two uh, images at the right, the burial chamber at the left, difficult to see, but it still is a pulpit, but now seen uh, from uh, front side, not from a side. <clears throat> okay, now this set of images from Medina um, uh, is uh, still in North Africa, is a very common way of illustrating uh, Dalai al Khairat. But suddenly, and I date this tentatively uh, from the middle of the um, uh, 18th century, um, uh, there is 
another set of images. And um, there's still the image of Medina, and in the uh, image of Medina, we see the composite burial chamber with the, the three graves and the uh, separate grave of Fatima. We see um, the, the pulpit, we see other elements, but next to that is suddenly an uh, image of Mecca. Now, Mecca has not come uh, uh, into um, my discussion of the Laila al Khairat at all, and um, simply because it, it does not occur there. It is not an issue in this prayer book. This prayer book is exclusively, solely devoted to the blessings, the saying of blessings over the Prophet Muhammad. And um, now, here again, you can ask yourself um, if there is an image. Um, that uh, is given in a book, and the explanation why this image is here in this book uh, is not given, uh, uh, cannot be found in the book. You have to search for the explanation outside the book. It's a simple um, way of, of research. And then you have to think if you, as I did with the pulpit, I found a saying by the Prophet Muhammad saying that whoever is standing between the grave and the pulpit is, um, uh, uh, it is as if he is standing in the gardens of paradise. So I have been trying to uh, find a, something to explain the sudden um, uh, um, uh, appearance of um, uh, uh, the mosque uh, of uh, uh, Mecca. And um, I can come only, I will tell you in a moment, I, I will keep you for a while in suspense, um, only to, to one conclusion, but it is just a theory. Um, you must, um, as I said, the Dalai al Khairat is exclusively um, uh, uh, devoted to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the example for all Muslims in, in everything that he did, and also uh, he being in an extraordinary position as the bringer of the uh, divine revelation to mankind. But in focusing um, uh, on the Prophet Muhammad, Jajudi did something that in his time was absolutely important. As Yasmin has also said, he was fighting the Portuguese. And one of the things that you see in the biography of the Prophet is fighting the infidels. At first, Quraysh in Mecca, later, um, uh, the tribes uh, in um, uh, the Arabian Peninsula. And um, so you can follow uh, the, the prophet in this. But um, in the uh, large um, 18th century reform movements, of which we know now mostly only, not, only the uh, Wahhabi movement, but there have been many more in, in, in that um, um, uh, um, uh, period, uh, this exclusive devotion to the Prophet Muhammad had, I think, become somewhat offensive. And uh, uh, people would say, okay, the, um, the Prophet is a very important person in Islam, but don't forget God. And um, uh, so we see here the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad and the house of God. And the house of God, of course, first, because we, uh, this, this page comes before that page. Now, I can only come of an explanation of um, uh, the, the words by which this, this idea was given if I think of nothing less than the Islamic Shahada uh, itself, because that starts that there is no God, and then that Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. And um, in these 18th century and later, um, uh, um, um, uh, manuscripts, I think that the exclusivity of um, uh, devotion for the Prophet Muhammad in the illustrations was corrected, if you want to mention it like that, into um, a more fully Islamic uh, creed 
uh, in conformity with the um, uh, Shahada. And um, uh, it, another, I can't find of any other explanation. I think it is a, an, an, an excellent, the most beautiful text to su supposed to be behind this shift of illustrations. I will show you a few. This is a manuscript coming from Sumatra, early 19th century. This is um, uh, a much earlier representation of the Mosque of Mecca because we will see that the um, uh, illustrations of Mecca in the Dalai al Khairat were not invented by the copyists and the miniaturists, but they used uh, images that existed already. And here you see this is a 16th century uh, tile from, from Iznik, from Anatolia, where already uh, this type of um, representation of Mecca uh, is given. So there was an iconographical example for the later images of uh, Mecca, more or less as we have seen here, um, uh, around. So uh, painters could draw from examples that existed already. Or here, in an, in an entirely different text, in a dated manuscript of um, uh, late 16th century, we see here, um, uh, it's not a prayer book even, um, uh, it's a history of Mecca by al Nahrawali, where you see an image of the mosque in uh, Mecca. Now, I <clears throat> will conclude with uh, showing you a number of um, uh, images of Mecca and Medina. And here, again, also one of the um, uh, perspective images that, uh, that are a tradition of the uh, Ottoman uh, makers of uh, um, uh, uh, manuscripts of the Dalai al -Khairat. And you see that uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is depicted more or less in a in a style, with, uh, not in a very naturalistic style, but again, the basic iconographical elements here, the Kaaba, here the mosque of the, the, the burial chamber of the prophet, they are there. But if you look well, you see also other things. For instance, we know that Medina is in an oasis, so the ground is colored green here. Mecca is not in an oasis, so it has a sand color. And so there, People have been thinking about it. I think here the Bakhi al Harkat is also shown slightly out of town. And, and so it is not that you could use it as a roadmap, but the basic um, um, uh, uh, elements are there. I'll show you a few more. Here, this is from the same manuscript as I showed you the two perspective um, illustrations. Um, uh, example of the script. It is, of course, as you al already understood from the way of illustration, it is a luxury book. It is um, uh, done by a high quality calligrapher and it means that um, the book must have been made for an important um, uh, person uh, who was willing to pay for a very beautiful um, uh, manuscript. And it shows that the Lail al Khairat was a book that was well known and used in high uh, social and political circles. <clears throat> Here, an, uh, a different style coming from Kashmir. I first thought, but, but I have added in my description Gujarat also because um, uh, last year in the um, uh, National Library in, in uh, Paris, I found a manuscript with almost the same illustration of Mecca here, Medina there, um, where it was explicitly said it comes from Gujarat. But I'm not sure that this is coming from there. A 19th century uh, manuscript. You see very abundantly made, very colorful. Um, I'm not sure that you can see it on the projection, but the gates uh, of the great mosque in Mecca uh, have their names written here. But it is 
the Dalai Lama should never be, as, as is clear to you, I hope, never be considered as a sort of pilgrimage guide. When you see, um, uh, often people think, okay, there are uh, images from Mecca and Medina, so this must be a pilgrimage guide. It is not. Uh, the, the books on, on uh, the pilgrimage are entirely different, and usually they do not have uh, images, not the manuscripts at least. Here another one, a, a bit si more simple than the Kashmiri one, um, uh, also coming from India. I purchased it in, uh, in Pakistan some, uh, some 20 years ago. <coughs> and to, to end here, another uh, two uh, images, but now from an early printed edition uh, of uh, Dalai al Khairat. Uh, that was recently reprinted um, of Mecca here and um, uh, Medina there. And uh, with uh, these uh, printed images in which I show also that the pictorial tradition of the manuscripts goes into the, uh, pic the pictorial tradition of the printed editions of the Dalai al Khairat, of which there are many, many uh, available and uh, around. Um, uh, this goes on. I uh, finish with this. I thank you for your attention. <laughs>